So from the perspective of the U.S. and other rich countries particularly, uh, we're experiencing unprecedented, sharp, voluntary reduction in GDP, which was engineered in order to try to curtail the uh, pandemic. But the most important issue is not the current size of the contraction, but rather what will come next in terms of the speed and size of the recovery once places have reopened. I'm actually pretty optimistic on this front. I expect a sharp uh, V-shaped economic recovery in the United States and uh, elsewhere, partly because capital is basically in place. It's not a situation where we had destruction of physical or human capital. I think most of the linkages between firms and their workers and between firms and suppliers will be maintained. And I don't think too many firms will end up uh, going out of business, particularly larger ones. There's a very limited empirical history to look at to assess exactly what a V-shaped recovery will be and how probable it is. But that's my best guess about what will follow on the current uh, downturn. Actually, after major wartime uh, contractions of economic activity, in countries where you didn't have a tremendous amount of physical destruction. In World War II, you had a number of countries that were occupied by Germany. In particular, you have France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And in 1944, they're liberated from German occupation. And if you look at the recoveries after that, 1944 to 46, the average increases in gross domestic product over two years are between 40 and 50% for those countries. And I think that has something of an analog to the current situation. You basically had this shutdown, but you didn't destroy a lot of stuff that looks like capital. And then you open things up. And even though in those circumstances, you had the occupation for about four years, you had an extremely rapid uh, recovery. So that's why it makes sense to me that if the shutdown is terminated and we're reopening, that you could get back very quickly to the levels of economic activity that you were at previously. Let me try to illustrate a bit about what the trade-off might be in terms of thinking about saving lives versus saving economies. So I want to give you some uh, illustrative components of this kind of a calculation. Uh, the first thing you need to know is what's called the value of a statistical life. There's a large literature on this. A common number used there for the U.S. and for other rich countries is about $10 million per life saved. And I'm going to take that as a reasonable number. It's actually a pretty large uh, number. Second question is, how many lives do you save by having the kinds of interventions that have been put in place over the last few months. So in the U.S., for illustrative purposes, we are approaching 100,000 deaths. And I'm going to think about it as though maybe you can save an additional 100,000. That would be a kind of reasonable magnitude. If you multiply that by $10 million per life, you get an aggregate calculation. What is this all worth? That's $1 trillion. And that's 5% of the U.S. annual GDP. Now, it's a lot different if you think you can save 1 million lives, which is the kind of number that's more like the great influenza pandemic 1918. Then it would be worth 10 trillion, and that would be a half a year's GDP. The third thing is how much are you losing in economic activity because of these interventions and shutdowns? I'm going to take that as though GDP is reduced by 20% at an annual rate, then it's worth to keep that in place for about three months if what you're saving is 100,000 lives. That's the calculation for the U.S. And that's about the political calculation that in fact seems to be working out. Because after two to three months, it seems like we're moving to relax the extreme interventions that were put in and things are opening up.
I mean, the other question in terms of recovery is whether the disease is going to go away or not, or whether we're going to have a second wave. Now, in the great influenza, you did have a second wave, which was much worse than the first wave. So after the spring of 1918, you had this second wave from September to February 1919, which was by far the worst. I said a little bit about a potential second wave, and I really have no great way to predict that. It's definitely a possibility, but it's not inevitable. And the vaccine track seems to be quite promising and on a much uh, more rapid uh, timescale than is normal. So I think that can be positive.